Hello and welcome to Talks on Law. I'm Joel Cohen. Today we're going to be talking about social media deplatforming, what laws, if any, are implicated, and I think we have the perfect guest. Eric Goldman is a professor of law at Santa Clara Law. He co-chairs the High Tech Law Institute and is also the Dean for Research. Eric, did I get any of that right? <laughs> you got it all right. It's good. Well, welcome. It's a real pleasure to have you back on Talks on Law. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. There's been some very famous examples of deplatforming. I can't imagine of one more high profile than former President Trump being removed from Twitter and Facebook. Honestly, I think uh, uh, the deplatforming of President Trump was, was truly a watershed moment in our understanding about the relationship between social media, uh, its users, and the government. And we'll be talking about a couple of topics, but you know, I think core to our conversation is, are there any rights? Are there legal recourse for those who are deplatformed? And we'll, we'll get into the weeds and, and talk about some of the, the legal arguments and, and a number of cases, but is there a short answer? So this is like the TLDR of the uh, of this interview, right? It's Too like, long didn't uh, read. Do people who are kicked off of a social media service have any recourse against the social media service? Answer, and this is really efficient for a law professor to say it this way, no. And so now we're going to explain why the answer is no. There's a lot of reasons to, to get unpacked in that no. But, you know, I'm, I hope your viewers aren't going to stop right here. Like, okay, so there's no rights. I got it. I'm going to I'm going to hit you with what might be a curveball a little bit later a recent case where the outcome may or may not raise at least the possibility of some recourse and why don't we keep that as a little bit of a incentive for the the viewers to keep watching one of the things that we hear often by those who are removed from the social media platforms is hey what about my rights what about my constitutional rights why don't we get a quick overview why doesn't the first amendment give users protection. Right, the first one that talks about the right to free speech. And so in general, we think about this idea, I get a right to express myself. And that's true, but it is a, a restriction only on government activity. The government can, cannot take away our right to free speech. But it doesn't ensure that we get the right to speak wherever we want and in any variation that we want. The government can restrict some of the ways that we speak. For example, they can impose things like time, place, and manner restrictions and say, you can have your say, you just can't have your say here. Um, but none of those concepts extend to private actors. The idea is that um, uh, private actors are not the government. They're not, uh, we don't support them with our tax dollars. We're not uh, required uh, to, um, uh, to, to provide the financial support to them. Um, and they can't impose the kind of remedies that the government can impose on us. They can't go and garnish our wages or they can't throw us in jail. So they're just a different entity in our society. And so private actors have their own free speech rights or it, it equally important constitutional right is the right to free press, which is listed right next to the right to free speech. And the idea is that if someone is a publisher of content, they get the right to decide what content they want to publish. That's their free speech right and their free press right. This is such an interesting tension and one that really is at odds with the the feeling of those who are, who are deplatformed. And and again, as we mentioned up at the top, that's not to say that they haven't lost something. As you pointed out, it's you know social media can be an important form of connectivity. It can be an important way to express political speech. It just so happens that that liberty, the way that it is uh, crystallized in our government is through the First Amendment, which only focuses on government restriction. And let's just point out the example here, if I can give it. You know, so when Twitter and uh, Facebook deplatformed Trump, they didn't take away his rights to free speech. He is free to speak. He's just not free to speak there. And of course, he has found other outlets uh, to express himself. Yeah, he had to go and create his own social media uh, platform, not something that, you know, mere humans like you or I could do very easily. Well, he could certainly go to other uh, social media services. And he was in negotiations, I think, with some of them who would have been delighted to welcome him. Um, so it's not like he had to build his own. The only point is that if you think about the thousands of different places that he could express himself online, there were two that said, you're not welcome here. 
What about the argument, and I, I know from, from the case law that it hasn't been successful to date, but what about the argument of this is the new town square, uh, that a private entity can behave enough like a public venue that it can be treated as such under the constitutional uh, structure? This argument has been advanced uh, many times over many years, actually. There's literature from 20 plus years ago uh, discussing this particular argument. The idea is that there are certain spaces where the government has less control over the people's right to speak. So the most traditional places uh, uh, for free speech are things like streets and parks. These are areas where the government's ability to, to stop people from talking is reduced. They still have some ability, it's just lessened because they're considered to be among the most um, important ways for people to be able to express themselves in physical space. Now, of course, going to uh, um, a park nowadays and shouting in the uh, uh, you know, uh, free speech corner isn't going to help a whole lot. You'd much rather shout on social media where people are likely to hear you than shout in a physical space where people aren't listening. And so the argument is that, that the social media services have become the equivalent of the new streets or parks for purposes of where people should have the, the most ability to be able to express themselves. It, again, misses this, this more fundamental issue that the streets and the parks are provided by the government and free speech protections are for speech on streets and parks is based on the fact that the government can't restrict that behavior. So anytime that we try to say that a private entity, a publisher of content is like the new town squares, like the new streets or parks in the, of the digital era, we're again mixing the metaphors. We're now talking about a very different concept. And there have been limited circumstances where private entities have been treated like streets and parks for purposes of um, uh, First Amendment ap applicability. Is this the old company town example where you know, maybe you're a coal miner, but you live in a, in a city that's basically built, owned, and operated by the company that you work for? That's correct, right. So it, it looks like a government-operated town. It just so happens that all of it is owned by private, uh, is private property, uh, owned by a single company. Um, and so a circumstance like that, we might say, since there are no government-provided streets or parks to go to, we're going to treat the privately-owned streets and parks as the equivalent. Um, another example has involved shopping centers. There are some limited ability of shopping center operators to kick people off their property um, who are trying to uh, advance their uh, speech agenda. Um, that particular doctrine applied to shopping centers has become quite controversial. And frankly, it's really kind of like a dead end in the case law. To the extent that that's even still good law today, it's not been applied to virtual shopping centers. It literally means physical shopping centers and only that. Um, so the arguments about the social media becoming a new town square, they, they make a lot of sense from an intuition standpoint. Yes, this is where the conversation is taking place. It's just like the conversation was taking place right. in this different venue in older days. We should treat it the same. But because it switches from government operated to privately operated, it switches from the physical space to virtual spaces, and it switches from property operators to publishers, you know, the switch is so huge, it just doesn't actually work. You've reviewed dozens of, of deplatforming related cases. Uh, would you say that the First Amendment argument is a common one that you see raised before the courts? Yeah, we certainly see it. Uh, I don't recall how many of the cases uh, in the data set um, specifically advance the First Amendment argument. Um, but really, in uh, uh, those cases have just uh, uh, ended quite quickly nowadays after an important Ninth Circuit ruling in 2020 where the plaintiff teed up this argument that it's like a virtual shopping center. And the Ninth Circuit just said, no, it's not. And since then, uh, those arguments have become less common because they're clearly futile. Another argument that we see in these cases is based on some form of discrimination. You're not willing to hear my particular viewpoint. You're discriminating against me as a member of a group. Uh, what's, I suppose, the legal basis of these type of claims? And then we can talk about how the reason why courts haven't, haven't been willing to accept them. The discrimination arguments are, are really quite confusing. You have to unpeel a lot of layers of the onion to actually even understand how the argument is being framed. Um, 
but I, I don't like the term discrimination at all here because it's usually a euphemism for what I call editorial discretion. The idea is that any publisher has hundreds or thousands or more data inputs and they pick which of those data inputs they actually want to share with their audience. Now I'll give you an example. I've now been on your show a couple of times, but I don't get the right to come in all the time and say, uh, I wanna uh, be on your show, in part because you're choosing what you think is fit for your audience. It's your editorial discretion. So when someone says that they're being discriminated against, what they're really trying to say is that you exercised your editorial discretion not to publish my content, and I don't like that. And so we generally hate discrimination. We view discrimination just as a, a societal bad. But because that wording is so value-laden, it actually distracts us from the fact what they're, what they're really saying. It's impossible to be a publisher without engaging in editorial discretion. You, it, literally, that's the definition of being a publisher. And that editorial discretion, by definition, discriminates between some people who get the access to the audience and others who don't. We had a, a, a conversation somewhat recently with Professor Nadine Strassen, who used to be the president of the ACLU. And I actually asked her specifically, you know, what if a social media company embraced a political bias? You know, uh, if Twitter decided uh, we'd like to ban Republicans from commenting on the platform, you know, point blank, uh, would that uh, be unconstitutional? And she actually said no. Absolutely not. And let me explain why. Um, so the whole point of editorial discretion is that the publisher decides what's fit for their audience. If they want to cultivate an audience that's interested in only libertarian content, they should be able to do that. That's a constitutionally protected right. They're free speech, free press rights. Um, so the fact that publishers might prefer one particular political agenda over another is actually constitutionally protected. Now, the only reason why this even gets the slightest bit unclear is because services like Facebook and Twitter have generally tried to position themselves as welcoming to all different viewpoints. They try to say we are not politically biased in a particular way, um, which would have been their right to do so. They are free to do that, but they have generally tried to position themselves as welcome to all comers. And so that's where there starts to get some tension where the public perception is they want my content because they're inviting everyone to come and the service are saying, actually, you know, there are some limits to what we want and you're not in it. Now, when we talk about it from a discrimination standpoint, the hard part then is it's like a statistics problem. It's almost impossible to provide equal treatment to all viewpoints. That doesn't, that concept doesn't even really make sense. I don't even know how to frame that concept. Um, so, by definition, if there's any unequal treatment in a political viewpoint, for example, that there's you know uh, a disproportionately larger percentage of libertarian content than whatever the baseline ought to be, then the that all the other political parties could say you discriminate against me because you favor the libertarians. Yeah, it sounds like an an exercise in in futility. I, I mean, it, it could be done. It's just a perpetual litigation machine. Um, and so you can you can think about this. Imagine this in the employment context where you've got the idea. You have to establish some baseline. What's the right percentage of minorities of specific uh, uh, categories or uh, uh, specific genders? What's the right percentage for each? You have to establish some baseline. And then you can show whether or not you know, one minority or gender is uh, anywhere above that baseline. The moment you show that, by implication, all the other minorities and genders have the potential to claim I was discriminated against. One departure might lead to 12 lawsuits and... Uh... It's a perpetual litigation machine because there's always going to be somebody who is going to claim they were discriminated against because statistics. Um, and so... This, we never run into this issue in the publication world. It just never comes up. The reason why is because publishers have that constitutionally protected right to decide that they actually want to be, quote, biased. And if they do, the Constitution backs them up. So the fact that even if a service doesn't want bias but ends up being biased, they still get the same constitutional protection. Well, there are some impermissible biases, like companies aren't permitted to discriminate based on race or, or religion or even uh, for the most part, gender. Um, is that why you see a lot of these claims? They're saying I'm being discriminated against because of uh, my 
my being um, my race or my religion. So we have to be a little more precise about what discrimination restricts. There's certain circumstances where it's actually permitted to engage in gender or racial discrimination. And you can take the example of, uh, you know, a women's only college. That's not a, you know, illegal activity to offer a women's only college. But usually what's happening is they're not saying that you published more content from whites than minorities. What they're usually saying is that I advanced a white nationalist view, and therefore, if you removed it, you discriminate against me because I am white. And it's that flipping from the, the topical issue to the identity of the speaker that actually can, you know, mixes it all up together into a way that sounds really bad, but it's actually, in many cases, what we want. Interesting. Well, Professor, I want to talk through another another claim that we've seen in some of these cases, um, and that's more of a, a breach of contract type of a claim. But in order to get into that, maybe we can talk about the house rules of social media companies. Uh, would you mind giving a quick overview? Yeah, so there's three basic categories of content that a social media service needs to address. There's content that is, quote, illegal. And that sounds really bad, but often it's not clear whether or not content's illegal. So we have this category of illegal content that we assume internet services are going to want to suppress, but we should know that it's not always clear the boundaries of that category or if any particular item fits into that category. There's a second category of what we might call lawful but awful content. It's not illegal content, but it's content that services have decided is not fit for their audience. And that is what is covered by, quote, the services house rules. They say, we won't allow anything that's illegal because we're not allowed to, but we're also going to exercise our editorial discretion to eliminate uh, uh, other categories of content that is legal. It just doesn't work for us. And then the third category is content that is uh, content that the internet service wants to publish or wants to have available to its users um, is the legal and uh, uh, acceptable content. So services are constantly trying to categorize content into one of these three categories. Is it legal? We probably have to do something. Is it a violation of our editorial policies? Well, then we're going to make the discretion that we decide we don't want it or that we want to downgrade it or otherwise uh, diminish it. Um, or is it content that we want fit for our audience and maybe, in fact, we like it so much we want to give it extra boost or amplification? And, you know, some examples of the lawful but awful or you just... Uh, type of content that platforms have decided that they find undesirable and therefore will not permit. This might be bullying, things like dangerous misinformation, or for some platforms, it may be uh, nudity or pornography, you know, those type of things. Yeah, uh, you've touched on several, but let's chunk them up into a bunch of categories. First of all, there's this broad category of things that might be called hate speech. This is where people are just being mean to each other or denigrating other people based on physical attributes or on uh, positions that they've taken, not based on the merits. And most people wish there was less hate speech in our society. Um, but many forms of hate speech are constitutionally protected, meaning that the government can't prevent them from being uh, advanced. Um, so that's where the House rules can be helpful. The House rules can say no hate speech. We don't want that kind of... Uh, uh, content, even if it would have been legal under uh, under the uh, constitutional provisions. Another category is this category of misinformation or disinformation. There's times where people just advance things that are not true. Now that happens all the time, but in some cases they could be uh, you know, pose health or safety concerns. So, for example, if there's a you know a meme that says you should be drinking bleach as your way of trying to cure COVID, um, that's the kind of thing that that might be legal, believe it or not. It might be protected by the Constitution. It's just a terrible idea, and it's something that um, uh, services might not want their audiences to be exposed to. And then you mentioned kind of these general co content uh, categories like nudity or pornography. Much of that is constitutionally protected. And then some services decided that's just not the kind of discourse they want. They don't want to have uh, their audience uh, encountering uh, pornography, um, even though it would be legal. Uh, that's just not that's not going to advance their discourse. There's a bunch of other things that we might describe. You're kind of hinting out with things like bullying. But another big category might be something like what we call spam. Uh, might be commercial promotion of uh, goods or services um, that simply the services decide they don't want uh, that kind of promotion on their uh, network. 
Because at the end of the day, these are businesses. So uh, uh, when the Facebook team is thinking about what what will make people more interested in spending more time on the platform, these types of actions, these types of behaviors, these types of content may be seen as undesirable. Yeah, because that's what their audience wants. Um, that's what their audience expects them to do. And if they don't do a good job about that, their audience feels like that's not a place that's welcoming to them. Right. And it's constantly uh, evolving uh, as as all social media is, um, which may result in some of the confusion or some of the frustration where individuals may say, look, why was my action worthy of deplatforming when I see so many other things out there that aren't? When can or 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 can the house rules create a legal cause of action? So, you know, if if Facebook says we I mean, I know the rules are, are pretty broad and give a lot of discretion, but if it says, you know, we permit this type of action and then I'm deplatformed for that type of action, could I have a cause of action? So let's start with the full package of, of relationships between the social media services and the users. Usually when a user signs up for a service, they agree to something like a terms of service or toss. And that terms of service or toss will have a bunch of things that will disclaim the obligations and liabilities of the internet service. In particular, they'll usually have something that says, we can remove your content uh, or terminate your account whenever we want in our sole discretion. Now, they might put it in slightly different words, but that becomes part of the contract with the user. And so long as that's part of the contract with the user, almost everything else doesn't really matter. So if they say, here's what we want you to do, or we'd say, this is what we're trying to accomplish, doesn't really matter that the user might then uh, feel aggrieved about the fact that they got targeted or singled out um, or they were even out of band with the uh, rules because because the rules themselves said we can do whatever we want whenever uh, however we feel like it. So normally, when internet services express their house rules, they express them as these are the things we aspire to. These are the things we're hoping to do. Not guarantees that you will never uh, that we will never deviate from these rules. And so it's in in false advertising land. We sometimes make distinctions between factual claims, where there's a promise of what the product will do, and what we might call puffery, when these are statements that you can't, they're really not uh, uh, concrete promises, and therefore they can never be right or wrong because they were never meant to be treated as if they're uh, binding commitments in the first instance. And so I think of a lot of the things that uh, are called house rules, they're in the puffery category in the sense that they're not promises, they're simply uh, uh, idealized objectives. Um, now, it is possible for an internet service to say, we will never remove you. Um, we'll never take down your account. They could say that, um, and they could you know, not have some catch-all saying, we can do whatever we want later. Um, they could simply make that flat-out promise. Even they could say, we will only remove you if we're legally required to, which, as I mentioned earlier, um, actually isn't really a clear standard because what's illegal or not is not always a binary zero-one determination. Um, but they could make that promise. We will only take uh, down your content, we will only terminate your account if the law demands us to do so. And yet every service has to make these editorial judgments or else their entire community becomes overrun by what I call the trollers and the spammers. Um, that you know, the people who are looking for fights or the people who are looking to make a quick buck, they become the dominant discourse and nobody wants to be in a service like that. You have to curb those activities, even if they're legal, um, in order to maintain a robust audience. Well, Professor, there's a recent case that's that's been uh, touted in the news, uh, a, a gentleman named Alex Berenson, who claims to have won a case like this. Uh, are you familiar with that particular case? I am. W what do you think of his claims uh, r related to the settlement that he made with Twitter? So uh, Alex Berenson uh, was posting information that might be categorized in the COVID misinformation category. Um, and uh, services have increasingly wrapped, uh, uh, ratcheted up their efforts to try and uh, reduce or eliminate the COVID misinformation. Um, and that can, I include in that category the anti-vaccine efforts. Uh, there have been efforts to denigrate the efficacy or safety of 
the vaccines, and those have then act as a possible deterrent to people getting vaccinated against COVID. Um, and services have also taken efforts to try and control that type of content. Um, so uh, Berenson uh, may have run afoul of Twitter's standards for what constitutes COVID misinformation. And as a result, that triggered consequences that included him losing his account. He sued Twitter and he brought a standard panoply of claims, much like many of the plaintiffs do. Um, but he had uh, some unusual facts that very few other plaintiffs had. He claimed that he had promises that were made by Twitter executives that he was not going to lose his account. Now, that doesn't happen very often, and there are two main reasons why. Most of the time, Twitter doesn't really care what happens to the users. They certainly don't care. They're not going to make any promises to me about the safety of my account or you know, the you know, preservation of my account. They don't care if I'm on the service or not. Um, and the second is that there was a case about a dozen years ago where a court said, if you make promises like that, you might actually be held to them. And we got the message across the industry that you should be making promises to your users about uh, whether or not you're going to remove their content uh, because you might actually be obligated to do so. So nobody does that anymore. So Berenson had either a situation where he was interpreting the statements from the Twitter executives differently than what they said, or the Twitter executives had made promises that were what I would call ill-advised uh, because of the lessons that we had from this case uh, a decade ago. So either way, because of that, he was able to then get Twitter to restore his account, something that's quite unusual, but he never got the judge to order that. He, that was an agreement between Twitter and him, and I don't know what the terms of that agreement are. I don't know if there's additional promises, or representations about what he can or cannot do, um, but he's claiming a win based on the fact that Twitter changed its mind. Um, but to be clear, the court never actually ordered Twitter to do so. This was a, a settlement, so it never it never got to that point. Right, and the settlement may have been based on the fact that Twitter decided they're sick of fighting. They may have decided we're going to give them permission to come back, but we'll put them on a short leash. Or they may have decided we have legal exposure that we need to manage, and we can do so by giving them this account back. We don't know which of those stories is, uh, uh, fits these facts. Maybe this is a good time to mention that an account termination from a platform, while you know, it's technically permanent in the sense that it doesn't expire. It doesn't preclude them from reinstating an account at, at some subsequent date. That's correct. Although, actually, in many cases, especially at Twitter, they'll do what's called a, uh, they'll suspend the account. So they don't actually terminate the account. They just make it so you can't access it and you can't post to it. Um, so it's, it's a functional equivalent of a termination, but they might, it, from a technical back end, it might be easy. Okay, just lift the suspension and then immediately everything goes right back into place. Professor, one thing that we haven't talked about is Section 230. Um, you know, this is something that you've spent a lot of time uh, writing about, uh, teaching. How does Section 230 fit into today's conversation? So Section 230 says that websites aren't liable for third-party content. Um, it has two provisions, and I'm going to ignore the second provision, which is one of the things that the plaintiffs have focused on. But I want to focus on the, the, the principal consequence of Section 230. Websites aren't liable for third-party content. Um, and starting with the cases, some cases about a dozen years ago, courts have said that a user uploading content to a service is considered to be third-party content to the service. It's not the service's content, it's the user's content, and that's the equivalent of third-party content for Section 2 there's purposes. So where a service terminates an account or removes or downgrades content, uh, they can't be legal liable because websites are liable for third-party content, including the removal thereof. That principle is really clean and elegant, and it governs a lot of these circumstances because that's exactly what the plaintiffs are trying to do. They're trying to say, you removed my content. The server says, but it's third-party content, and I'm not liable for whatever I do with it, including choosing not to publish it. Um, end of the story, uh, plaintiff loses. Now, there are some limits to Section 230's applicability. The most important one is how we started the conversation. If the plaintiff claims that the service is a state actor and therefore is obligated to follow the First Amendment, Section 230 doesn't apply. It's a statute, not a, not a uh, part of the Constitution. So Congress can't control uh, how that's interpreted. The other place where Section 230 may not matter is with these breach of contract discussions that we were uh, just having. Um, that if a service makes a promise to a user 
then that promise might override the statutory default in the sense it might be waiving whatever protection they they uh, had under Section 230 and, and providing a different deal. Um, believe it or not, there's a number of cases, including in the account termination area, where courts have nevertheless said that if you're suing based on breach of contract because the service uh, decided not to publish your content, you are, in effect, uh, holding them liable for third-party content and the breach of contract claim fails. What we found in our research uh, when we did the initial data set is that less than half of the cases actually even involve Section 230. So Section 230 is an important part of this conversation, but there are lots of other plaintiff claims that are being advanced that are failing on other or for other reasons. Um, and we found that um, uh, the Section 230 uh, rulings um, actually in that sense were quite helpful because they gave the court a way to eliminate the case quickly without getting into like messy constitutional pr uh, provisions that they didn't have to and still getting to the exact same place. The plan's going to lose. Section 230 just gives a fast lane for the judge to reach it. Professor, let, let's talk about some, some cases. When you look at the lawsuits that are being brought, what are the... Uh, are there particular types of content that are more common uh, to result in this deplatforming and subsequent lawsuit? So I'm going to talk just about the lawsuits, but there's an underlying question here. Are there more, uh, are there categories of content that are more likely to get removed or to trigger account terminations that don't lead to lawsuits? Um, so, you know, uh, uh, people are losing their accounts every day. Uh, content is being uh, removed or downgraded every day. Um, and I, uh, I said maybe I'm tracking 75 cases. Well, obviously, that's a trivial fraction of the overall people who might be aggrieved by the fact that their content was removed or their account was terminated. So we, all, we have a very small slice of the um, uh, overall phenomenon of account termination and content removal when we only look at the court cases. Now, within that, the court cases, the dominant theme has been what I call the MAGA lawsuits, that these are people who are... Uh, you know, trying to wave the flag for Make America Great Again using either culture war specific issues like I want to attack uh, trans people um, or their, uh, you know, uh, adherence of President Trump's actual statements um, and then trying to evangelize those and getting into fights over that or just making statements that they can't actually back up. And a lot of the MAGA claims have involved things like COVID misinformation or that anti-vax material. The platform may be saying, okay, well, this is just demonstrably false, or we think this is false and dangerous. You know, their claim is, no, this is actually political speech that's uh, not only my opinion, but believed by millions across the country. We have very fundamental partisan divides. A very simple question. Was President uh, Biden duly elected and properly elected? And that's a partisan factual question because the facts in uh, partisan land A differ from the facts in partisan land B. Um, and so the services can either say, we'll just create a mosh pit and let everyone thrash it out and everyone's going to be hating each other even more. Or they can say, we're going to take a side. We're going to choose the side of we believe President Biden was duly elected and that anyone who's challenging that is, is potentially engaged in election misinformation that's corrosive to our democracy. And we can't tolerate that. We're not going to be a tool of the end of the Democratic Republic um, uh, of our country. Um, and so uh, services are, are torn either way. They're, they're, there's no winning in those circumstances. Either they uh, you know, become this, this partisan food fight or they make a factual choice that has partisan implications that lead to whoever didn't get what they want, in this case, the people who want to um, disseminate election and misinformation, those people saying, you are biased against me, you discriminate against me, you took away my uh, free speech and all the things that we've been discussing up to now. I want to throw one, one question at you. What if, what if the platforms went the other direction and banned, uh, banned speech related to uh, yes, President Biden was elected and only permitted uh, the, you know, the, the stop the steal type argument. Would that be, would that pose any legal issues? So uh, I don't have all the empirics. It is uh, possible that some of the social media services today are actually taking that position and actually uh, removing things that are, uh, you know, supporting the legitimacy of Biden's presidency and encouraging 
amplifying and uh, highlighting the stop the steal type of positioning. Um, so, and uh, from my perspective, I'm actually okay with that. Um, that's their constitutionally protected right. Um, if, if there's an audience for that, uh, I understand that they have the freedom to cater to it. I will not be a part of that audience. That's not the kind of content I want. And I'd like to think that that's a niche audience. To, to be clear, though, uh, you know, those conversations would take place in the offline world. They just wouldn't be as large uh, in the offline world. Um, and we would un unquestionably acknowledge that if people get together into a meeting and want to talk about why they think President Biden was not duly elected, that that would be a constitutionally protected conversation. There's one other way in which uh, the plaintiffs are trying to force internet services to publish their content. They're alleging that the private publishers have become arms of the government because the government's instructing them how to make their content moderation decisions. Essentially, they're arguing that the private platforms have become agents of the government because of the government's compulsion. We sometimes call that jawboning, where jawboning is really this idea that you can talk somebody up or down through coercive power. Um, and uh, that's arguably what uh, some people believe is taking place, that the, that the government is constantly feeding information to the social media services that they want the services to do more to reduce the COVID misinformation or to reduce the election misinformation. And those, those instructions of the government turn the services into agents, which then means that they are obligated to follow the First Amendment. That argument has been advanced in a number of cases. And Berenson, one of the cases we discussed, he actually has uh, evangelized some evidence where he believes that he was removed because of job owning from the Biden administration. That this was an administration official who said, hey, why, why aren't you guys doing something about this guy? He's, uh, he's a big misinformation spreader. You should take him off the platform. Essentially, that was the, the uh, evidence that they were uh, marshalling. And then, you know, the, the problem with the legal argument is let's assume all that's true that you've got some mid-level staffer in the White House who's sending an email over to a social media server saying like, hey, what's up with this guy? He looks like he's creating a problem for our community. That doesn't convert every decision then that's made by that social media service into a government-directed uh, decision. It doesn't even convert that individual decision uh, into doing so. Now, there are circumstances where we could imagine that the government does coerce publishers into making publication decisions they don't want. And we would call that censorship. And we would say that the publisher should have a right to fight back against that. And possibly then we might say that whoever speech was targeted might have an independent right to force the publication of their content, even if the publisher doesn't want it. That last piece is really not defensible. And that's essentially what the job owning uh, plaintiffs are arguing, that I can now force you to carry content that you chose to remove whether it's compelled or whether you would have done it voluntarily, I can force you to nevertheless carry it. Um, and that's just, that's just a non sequitur. That's not an appropriate remedy. I do think that if, in fact, job owning is taking place in a way that is censorship, that the people whose content is being removed should have a claim against the government. I am concerned about the government exercising its uh, soft, coercive power to control speech. The thing is that the evidence that the plaintiffs are marshalling doesn't come anywhere close to that. Professor, you could imagine that pressure being very real, you know, uh, hey, uh, Facebook, what are you doing about this? Do we need to start a new committee to investigate you? Or are you going to do the right thing? That could really uh, get the wheels moving at one of these social media platforms. I 100 percent agreed. Unfortunately, that happens all the time anyway. And it happens by both political parties, or it happened under President Trump's administration, and it's happening under President Biden's administration. You go back to Obama, it was happening even then. That's just the way the government works. Government regulators sometimes view themselves as negotiators. Like, hey, you got something I want, I got something you want, and let's 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 horse trade. Um, and if all of those interactions lead to claims that I can now force my content onto a private publisher's uh, service because of the fact that the, I was targeted by the government, then 
basically everyone has a claim. You know, you have a claim, I have a claim, we all have claims because we've been targeted um, through some conversation that's taken place between the government and these private entities. So the law doesn't enable all that though. Um, it's a very narrow set of concerns when you've got really the right mix of the government coercion um, against a particular categories of speech um, that you can actually have a tenable claim. And as I said, the facts haven't supported that yet. I could imagine facts where that would be the case. If we see those, we need to be fighting against it. The real thing we need is we need the government to stop trying to tell publishers what they should publish. That's an abuse of the government position, whether or not it's legally actionable. That's something that we just tolerate. And in fact, as so long as the government is advocating whatever the partisans want, they're actually cheered for giving those instructions to the uh, to the private publishers. Um, so the payoffs are all misaligned right now in terms of curbing government abuse. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of a number of examples where I can remember government officials saying, hey, Facebook, and, and I'm picking on Facebook. I'm, I'm sure they've done the same thing for Twitter. Uh, the, the Alex Bornson examples on Twitter, but you know, hey, Facebook, you need to do something about online bullying or hey, Facebook, you really need to do something about radical language. And if you don't, there's going to be real consequences. Um, are, are you saying that that is also inappropriate? When the government tells a private publisher that it should be doing more to stop publishing constitutionally protected speech, that's a problem. That's something that we shouldn't tolerate as a, as a society. Now, we want to change the Constitution? Let's talk about that. Unlikely. If the uh, Constitution permits them to pass a law that, that restricts that content, then they should do that. But just saying, hey, we don't have the power to do anything here, but, but would you stand in our proxy and target this constitutionally protected speech? That, to me, is an abuse. Now, in my mind, that's quite different than saying, there's a society-wide problem that people are being incivil to each other. And here's all the tools that we need to wield in order to curb that problem. Wouldn't it be great if the social media services were doing more on the bullying front? I think that would be fine. I understand that. It might have that implicit coercion, but really it's also a conversation that we expect the government to have. If the government sees a public health or safety problem, they should be working to try and fix it. Um, and that might involve them identifying places where constitutionally protected speech is part of that problem. So it's a really thin line that I'm drawing, and I, and I understand that. It, it might sound a little bit confusing. But it, it's certainly helpful to understand that distinction uh, between when the government's actually forcing through its leverage uh, constitutionally protected speech, when it's uh, encouraging the removal of constitutionally protected speech, um, and when it's just talking about public health and safety concerns, which might include the publication of constitutionally protected speech. I want to double down on something that you've already mentioned, but I, I maybe I didn't catch it because you are, you speak very quickly. But if the government called Facebook and said, "Hey, we don't like Joel. He, he's saying some some things that are probably constitutional, but it's not helpful." So you need to shut down his account. And if you don't, we're going to, we're going to make things pretty difficult for you. Would I have a cause of action, I guess, against Facebook at all, if they then shut down my account, or would I have some type of, would I have to look for some cause of action against the government, uh, for, for singling me out? Uh, so certainly you would have a, a potential claim against the government. You might also have a claim against Facebook if they were then turned into an agent of the government and therefore obligated to comply with the, the Constitution because they became a state actor. But you, you, your, your fact setup, I just want to be clear, was so specific that it makes it a more sympathetic case than what's likely to happen. You said that, uh, you know, target Joel... And there will be bad things if you don't. But the government rarely has to say that. They rarely need to go that extra step. So a lot of times it's just an implied threat. Uh, we're going to make your life miserable if you don't take this action. That piece is almost never stated and is actually rarely a, a, a credible threat. So in, in a case like what we're discussing, it'd be made so much more difficult by the fact that there may be implied uh, benefits or implied uh, detriments by not listening to a government request. That's always true, right? I mean, the government always is the ultimate uh, holder of power. They can send the police into your office and arrest you and take you to jail. Um, 
And, uh, you know, uh, we saw what happened, for example, with DeSantis in Florida when he said to Disney, you came out and uh, uh, supported the LGBTQ community. We're going to take away a tax benefit from you that's worth a billion dollars as punishment. Um, you know, so we know the government has that power, whether it's state or not. The, my point only was it's rarely explicitly stated the way that you described. One more thing I wanted to raise with you on this topic before we move on to talk about new laws is mistakes. I mean, in your examples, you've described intentional decisions by uh, social media platforms to curate a, a more healthy, a more enjoyable experience, or even, you know, free speech protected publishing decisions that, look, we, we want less of this because that's our, our view. We don't want these controversial uh, health uh, uh, conversations on our platform because we don't like it or we think it's, it's risky. Um, but platforms also just straight up make mistakes um, have you seen that in any of the lawsuits? It's unclear when any of these actions were mistakes because usually the services don't have to admit that. They can simply say whether it was a mistake or not, we're still legally protected. Now, as a practical matter, if it was a mistake, it ought to have been fixed before we ever get to the lawsuit stage. Um, so. It's only in those circumstances where it's unclear if there was a mistake or it was a mistake, but the service decides that it's going to stand behind it anyway, um, where we would get a lawsuit about that. So uh, mistakes are inevitable um, when you're dealing with, with as many decisions as the, the Internet services make. Um, they're never going to bat a thousand. That's just not possible for them to do. Um, and, of course, we can imagine circumstances where if the mistakes become uh, the basis of legal claims, we're going to be overwhelmed with litigation just because of the law of large numbers. Professor, let's talk about these new laws that are attempts to change the status quo. What type of laws have been explored and, and what would they do? Uh, well, we have some laws already on the books, so this is not a hypothetical question. We literally have uh, two laws that were passed in Florida and Texas that very much get at the issues that we've been discussing throughout this uh, interview. And in particular, I'll mention the Texas law, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, talks about how uh, there needs to be consistent content moderation um, with the idea of trying to uh, mandate as a legal matter that internet services in, uh, manage their content databases consistently. And that leads to everything that we've been talking about till, till date. What does that even mean to have consistent content moderation? Um, because of the fact that no matter what, it's impossible to calibrate uh, that every person is equally situated, gets equal treatment. And so that's an example of a law that's coming out. Sounds really appealing. Yeah, why don't they just moderate their content uh, databases consistently? That's not unfair to ask. It's actually impossible, and it is unreasonable, and it's almost certainly unconstitutional as well. And what's happened with the Texas law so far? Has it, has it been stayed by a court? Uh, the Texas law was enjoined by a court, and then in just one of the most bizarre developments I've seen in recent years, um, the Fifth Circuit dissolved the injunction but didn't issue an, ex an opinion explaining why. So they put the law into effect without explaining why they thought the law was constitutional, which the district court did not agree. And so that, that decision by the Fifth Circuit went up to the Supreme Court in what's sometimes called the shadow docket, an emergency appeal, um, and the Supreme Court restored the injunction um, pending the Fifth Circuit issuing a decision that explains why they think that law is constitutional. Now, whenever they issue that opinion, that will also be appealed back to the Supreme Court. They may not take it. They probably will. Um, so we're going to have Supreme Court jurisprudence on this uh, issue relatively soon. The Florida case the Florida law was also enjoined. This is the frontier of Internet law today. We are seeing the battle going to the Supreme Court that has the potential to shape the future of the Internet. This is, this is like very, very high stakes uh, litigation taking place today. One of the things that's at issue, you mentioned the example of, uh, what, what was it, fair or consistent moderation. Um, some of these laws are, are changing what it means to be a common carrier 
Uh, what what does that language mean, and and what what are these laws attempting to do? So the concept of common carrier is is actually a very old concept, and it goes back to the idea that there were certain resources that were uh, imbued with enough of a public interest that we wanted those services to provide services to all comers. So, for example, you can imagine a bridge across the river where any other portage of the river would require you to go hundreds of miles out of your way. So there's just one way to get across that river. And the idea is then the bridge is supposed to allow all comers to go across the, the, the bridge. They're not supposed to set up barriers that say you can only cross if you're in this certain category of people. Railroads were another example about this, where the railroads would establish track that would be extremely costly to replicate and would, would take years to replicate. So instead of doing that, we, the, 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 the rule became that the railroads were common carriers. They had to take uh, all carriage, uh, you can't carry all the materials that they were asked to carry um, because of the fact that without them doing that, then uh, people could literally get stuck. And uh, so common carriage is this, this old venerable concept that uh, certain types of services have to treat all customers equally uh, because of the fact that they're imbued with this, this public interest. Um, it doesn't really fit anything that relates to the internet. Um, so, you know, the moment that we're talking about uh, social media services exercising editorial discretion, it's like apples and oranges. Now, we don't see services like the mail service or the railroads or the bridge operators exercising editorial discretion in the main. That's taken away from them. But they're not publishers in the first instance. That's not their function to act as uh, uh, deciding what's fit for their audience. It's just an apples and oranges comparison. Can social media companies be considered a common carrier under existing law? I think the short answer is no. And I think that there's two independent reasons why. They don't fit the model of common carrier. So the whole concept doesn't even make sense, like how you would draft it from a statutory standpoint. But I think the more important reason why we know it isn't going to work is because that would be unconstitutional. That would be essentially saying to the services, you have to uh, take all comers, which means you cannot apply your editorial discretion. And therefore, it's an incursion on the free speech and free press rights of the social media services. So it's just an untenable concept. It doesn't fit the model and the Constitution won't permit it. The Constitution won't permit it. Is that prohibiting states from passing laws attempting to to qualify social media companies as common carriers? That's correct. If the Constitution uh, restricts it, then it takes away the power of any government actor to try to impose common carriage obligations. So it doesn't matter if it's the Congress, if it's the state legislators, if it's an administrative agency, uh, all of them are prohibited from deploying that legal principle. So they can pass the law all they want. It it won't be enforceable. Well, you say that almost like, yeah, you know, why would they do that? But but you should recognize that's exactly what's happening. And it's being done for the messaging value. This is all part of the political corrosive division that we're experiencing is that this is a way to be able to tell their voters we're championing your interests. We're fighting for you to make sure that the power that's in the social media services won't be wielded to take away your free speech rights. None of that makes sense, but that's exactly what's driving the legislation, and that's exactly where the legislators are wasting their time and their constituents' money, and they're being rewarded for it. They're not being punished. It's inherently appealing to me in some ways. You know, I, I don't want these big, amorphous powerful social media companies kicking me off for no reason, uh, perhaps interfering with my livelihood if I, you know, for, for example, sell services uh, over social media. Uh, and, you know, the idea that the government might protect me, I could see why that would be appealing. Absolutely. But then if you, you take the next logical step forward, you can say, okay, who do I fear? Whose power do I fear even more than the power of social media? Answer, the government. And so it's, it's really a simple question. Who decides the rules for free speech online? Is it the government or the private entities? And it, when you frame the decision that way, there's no question, I want the private entities making that decision because I don't trust that the government will do it properly. And really we can see the abuses when they're passing laws that you 
yourself just mentioned, c come on, we all know those are unconstitutional. Um, we can pass them, but, but it, they're pointless. But they're not pointless, and that's exactly why we need to be fearful of how the government might misuse our power. If the Constitution is not protecting us, we know the legislatures won't protect us either. So that was common carriers. How was how is that related to the concept of uh, must carry laws? Uh, what is this must carry concept under the law? One other piece of what's called the censorship laws um, is what's sometimes referred to as a must carry obligation. It says you as a service do not have the discretion to remove content or to remove actors uh, from your service. And for example, the Florida law had several must carry obligations said, for example, certain political um, candidates simply could not be terminated uh, from the service during uh, particular periods of time. They had to be preserved uh, on the service, whether or not the service felt otherwise. Florida law also had a protection uh, for certain journalistic enterprises, basically saying uh, that the services couldn't decide whether or not they would carry content from these services. They were forced to carry them. This looks a lot like the common carriage model in the sense that it's, again, saying you have to treat all people equally, although it might be narrowly applied, like in these circumstances, you, you get favorable treatment if you're a politician or if you're these journalistic enterprises. Um, the must-carry obligation is just another form of government censorship. It's another way of saying you as a publisher lack the discretion to decide what's fit for your audience. We will tell you what uh, you must carry. Um, and therefore, anytime we see that kind of must-carry style obligation, it is actually censorship. It's not censorship, uh, restriction of censorship, it's an imposition of censorship. One additional area that we've seen in, in this legal reform reaction to social media deplatforming is a repeal of Section 230. Maybe you can, I guess, maybe start with the argument for appeal and then, uh, you know, uh, feel free to weigh in with your thoughts. Yeah, um, there's a variety of different rationales offered for why Section 230 should be repealed or reformed. Uh, many of the kinds of reforms would be functionally repealed. So I don't make a big distinction between the two. Um, and I can't put any credibility to them because they, they're they always, almost always so structurally misinformed or cynically partisan that they they don't survive even like the first level of scrutiny. The general idea is supposed to be that either uh, Section 3 repeal or reform would either force internet services to remove more antisocial content, or it would force internet services to carry more content that, that they're currently removing under the lawful but awful category, which to the other side is the things that actually they want internet services to remove as more antisocial content. So the reform efforts generally fit into these two partisan models, take more stuff down uh, or take uh, less stuff down, and neither of them are likely to uh, occur. And part of that's because of the fact that, as I've, we've discussed a few times now, Section 230 isn't the only part of the story here. Things like the Constitution or the company's contracts might also weigh in on the relevance of uh, a, a removal decision. And so removing Section 230 might not change the substantive outcomes from the services, but it would create potential liability in other ways that might very well change the fundamental structure of the Internet. So the entire repeal or reform Section 230 discussion gets so gummed up because Section 230 is often blamed for doing things that it's not actually responsible for, um, or it's assumed that you can predict how the services will respond to in a way that will be exactly what the regulators want, and that's almost certainly not going to be true. Professor, uh, you know, one more topic on the, I suppose, government, um, government reform or government inter intervention. How about when it comes to this concept of imposing digital due process, what are you seeing out there and uh, what, what legal questions does that raise? So there's been a variety of uh, uh, efforts that have been introduced or debated um, that are designed to create digital due process on private entities that mirrors the kinds of due process we expect from the government. Those can include things like uh, notice of any action being taken, an opportunity to appeal that action, a, a right to be heard. Uh, it can include things uh, like 
uh, an explanation of why the action was taken um, so that you're informed about the merits of the, uh, of the decision. And there's some other things that fit into the digital due process category, but those are the typical things. So notice the explanation and the appeals. I'm an opponent of all of that um, as a government compulsion because it's like mixing the streams. It's treating private entities as if they're the government when they're not the government. And it is treating uh, them as uh, uh, being obligated to uh, justify their editorial discretion when in fact they're free to exercise their editorial discretion however they want. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, if you think about the other publications throughout our society, um, we don't have due process against them. We don't get a notice of why they rejected, uh, that they've rejected our content. Uh, we don't get an explanation for why they rejected it. We don't get the right to appeal that internally within their company. Those are just foreign concepts to the entire publication process. Um, and the idea then that we would apply them to the internet services is really kind of this exceptionalism. Like, well, sure, those are publishers, but, but these entities are now so quasi-government-like we should treat them like a government. It just, it's such a mixed metaphor. It's actually, I think, pernicious. Do you think it's legal? I mean, first of all, I like the way you, you said, uh, well, when it comes to the government forcing them to do it, I'm opposed to it. You didn't say uh, more due process on social media is something I would be opposed to in and of itself. Um, in fact, my guess is you, you would, you'd welcome that if Facebook or Twitter uh, thought, you know, this will make for better user experience. That's absolutely correct. And I'll um, give you an example. Uh, Facebook in particular has moved towards trying to implement various due process uh, mechanisms into their standard operations. So they're trying to get better providing notices. They have created circumstances uh, where they're providing explanations. They have created circumstances where they're providing appeals. They even created a thing called the Oversight Board, which is an independent entity that users can appeal Facebook's decisions to. This is like the Facebook Supreme Court? Um, it's called the Facebook Supreme Court. Um, the title is the Oversight Board. They don't even use Facebook Oversight Board. They call themselves the Oversight Board. But the, the, the general principle is that Facebook has delegated some of its editorial discretion to this independent entity and said, we will honor the decisions of this independent entity. If it tells us we need to do something, we'll do it. All of that done voluntarily, not because the government compelled it, but because they think that that's in the best interest of their users. I support that. Now, I don't think that every service needs an oversight board or some equivalent. And I don't think that um, we should expect that every service is going to provide notice, explanation, and appeals because so many of the things that are being removed by the services are functionally the trollers or the spammers. They're not good faith actors, they're bad faith actors. And imposing the, the financial and logistical consequences of notices, explanations, and appeals to um, uh, to uh, bad faith actors just jacks up the cost for everybody with no real value delivered. Um, so when the government compels it, it actually then is imposing an extraordinary amount of cost and burden, and it's not actually benefiting the people that the government thinks it's benefiting. It's benefiting the spammers or the trollers, and they need no additional help. You said that it's it's perhaps not desirable to have the government step in and impose this. Could the government do it legally, I suppose, constitutionally, could they impose some type of due process burden on, say, social media platforms above a certain size? I think the short answer is no, um, but this is an area of active litigation as well. The Florida and Texas bills both raise the question squarely, um, and that those questions are almost certainly going to go to the Supreme Court in the next year. Um, I will mention that uh, in the Florida legal challenge, the appellate court specifically called out explanations and said that creating an explanations obligation was unduly burdensome, which meant that it didn't even survive the lowest level of, of um, constitutional scrutiny um, because of the fact that it imposes extraordinary amounts of costs as to bad faith actors. Um, so I, I, it was hard to see that the 11th Circuit got that piece but the 11th Circuit also endorsed some of the other principles that might look like digital due process and said those might potentially survive constitutional scrutiny. Um, I have material I'm writing on this topic that explains why I don't think that, that, that those other things should survive as well. Um, but we'll see what the Supreme Court says. But I think that calling them due process already frames the issue perfectly for the, the court. We know that due process applies to the government. It doesn't apply to private actors. They don't have that obligation. So as long as we're thinking about it as a due process issue, 
I think it reminds us that we're crossing those streams. I will also point out that if it's legal to impose on Internet services of a certain size, the question you asked me, it could also be that they could impose those on other types of publishers as well. They could impose them on broadcasters. They could impose them on newspapers. They could impose them on book publishers. Uh, they could impose them on you. And so we should be wary of the fact that anything that looks like censorship that gets, survives constitutional scrutiny will be widely embraced by the government across multiple vectors. Um, so just be careful here. If you think this sounds like a good idea, yeah, the government should be able to obligate it. Just think about how they could weaponize that to advance sensorial goals, because that's exactly what's going to happen. On that note, perhaps uh, I'll let you go. And, and as the Supreme Court raises this, uh, when they review a case like uh, the appeal of the Texas law, perhaps we can have you back for a, a further conversation. There will be lots more to talk about, but I'm glad we had a chance to talk through all this today. Eric Goldman is a professor of law at the University of, of Santa Clara School of Law. Eric, thank you so much for the time. That's a pleasure. What a delight having a chance to chat with you.